Good morning and welcome. Before the service starts, I just wanted to briefly explain what you're going to see today. So we've reduced a lot of what we were doing with the editing. So the broadcast is probably going to appear as a little bit more of a lower quality. But I wanted to show you all what we're going to be able to do each week. So we are running the same process that we would be running for producing this video with a live service. And so I wanted to show you all what it would look like. I know some of you are going to stay home because you need to stay home and you're concerned that you're going to be missing out. And so I wanted to show everybody this is exactly what the service is going to look like. Um, and this is giving us a really great opportunity to do a dress rehearsal because there are some technological gaps that we're having to jump through to make this happen. Uh, one of the exciting things is once we have these uh, different um, parts in place, we'll be able to use this indefinitely, which we are excited about the enhancements we're experiencing. So I just wanted to briefly explain why you're going to see a little bit different production this week. I hope that you enjoy today's service. Word is a lamp to my 
If you would please grab your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 13. We are continuing a mini series on understanding how to have a relationship with God. And just like the Elijah series, where I would beg you every time I would preach to go back and watch the next one, I'm going to make a slightly different appeal. Don't leave any one of these sermons behind, because if you do, you'll come to the end and you will say, I don't know how to walk with God. This series has failed me. I think if you'll stick with each one, God's going to transform your relationship with him, but it's not a take it or leave it kind of situation. Acts chapter 13, I'm going to introduce you to the character that we'll be studying for the very first principle in being able to have a relationship with God. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them, talking about having removed Saul. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. If I want to understand how to have a relationship with God, it makes sense to me to study those who Scripture says truly had a relationship with God. Let's pray, and then I'm going to introduce you to a moment in David's life which helps us understand not only why David did what he did, but how you and I can have a genuine relationship with God. David is going to be the one to introduce us to this first principle. Let's pray together. Father, as we dive into the message this morning, I pray for you to be glorified and for our minds to be filled with truth. May we remove every distraction and focus only on you. For when we measure everything that is in our lives, only the things that point back to you matter most. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I show you the principle in David's life, which I'll introduce you to it, let me just say this. Note takers, write down anything that lands with you, but be patient because in the end, I'm going to give you a boatload of principles to write down. So if you're a note taker, if something stands out, that's wonderful. The message that, uh, that you're going to get today is what we would call a narrative style And so we'll start with narration, going through a story, and then we'll draw some conclusions at the end. So again, note takers, if you could be patient with me. I know some of you are so diligent. Um, For me, when I'm taking notes, nothing is more troubling for me than when I'm like 20 minutes into the sermon and I have yet to figure out what the first point is. So that might be you today. You might be sitting there thinking, does he have a first point? Stick with me, you're going to get the principles at the end, some statements at the end, which will help us understand this first principle found in the life of David. From Acts chapter 13, where we are told that David is a man after God's own heart, would you please take your Bibles and go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. There are several different stories that we could use to try and understand 
why Scripture would say that David is a man after God's own heart, but I think that this one is probably going to be one of everyone's favorites. I know the kids that are watching right now are going to love hearing this story, Uh, but I also think that it really exemplifies the heartbeat of David even as a young man, that which we take for granted. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. If you haven't figured out 2 Samuel chapter 17, Saul is king, David is a shepherd. Israel is about to battle the Philistines. And before the battle begins, this giant man named Goliath comes moving through the army and stands in the valley and cries a challenge to all of Israel. It says in verse 8 that he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not... uh, Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, and pause, if you read verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, you're actually given uh, the statistics of this guy, right? What, what What are his stats? Over eight feet tall, just the head of his spear alone was 15 pounds. It weighed as much as a bowling ball. And he threw that through the air to take out his adversaries from a distance. I can't barely swing a 15-pound ball down an alley rolling it. And he would throw it at the end of a spear. And scripture says that his spear was like a beam. And so let's look at the response from Israel. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When I was in high school, we had a football team that was represented by all four years of high school. So freshman all the way to senior, we had one single team. We didn't have a junior varsity or a a varsity. We just just had our football team. And so uh, if we got to our first practices before school started in the fall and someone didn't show up, We were on the phone calling that guy and saying, why weren't you at practice? And so I remember one of the last two years that I played, we had every every male student, every guy was on the football team with the exception of two guys, if, if I remember correctly. And the two guys that couldn't play weren't allowed to play because they didn't weigh enough. You had to be at least 100 pounds to play, and they weren't 100 pounds. Everyone else was pretty much so required to be a part of the football team. And so we had this student body of like 80 or 90 people total. And we'd have 40 guys on the football team. No joke. So I'm standing there in practice one time. And the guy that's standing next to me is a grade older. I want to say I was like maybe a junior. And I think he was a senior. But we're standing there and we've got our arms crossed. We're in full gear. And we are in the last contact practice Before the game, we would have two practices before the game, one contact, and then one more final practice, and then we'd have the game. And it was the first game of the season, and we're standing there running this practice, and the coach is getting angry because we're not getting this play right. And so we're running, and he says, run it again, and we didn't do it right. He said, run it again, and at this point, they've pulled me out. I'm standing on the sidelines next to this guy. He's got his arms crossed. He's a little bit taller than me, so I kind of look over at him, and we're talking, having a you know, conversation while the coach is screaming at these other guys, and he says, you know, I just don't get it. 
So I started to explain the play. Well, you see, you know, he's on the line. I said, well, you see, you're a guard, and the guard has to pull, and it's called a cross buck. So one guy goes, no, 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 not the play. I don't get it. I said, what don't you get? And he said, any of it. I said, do you mean any of the play or any of defense? He said, like, for instance, why are there four downs? And I realized... Not only did he not know the play or his position, he didn't know anything about the game. If your expectation is that you're going to be able to hang with God in a friendship with him with no knowledge of who he is, you are kidding yourself. It doesn't work that way. Principle number one to having a relationship with God starts with a knowledge of God. And it's in this contest where Goliath has come out and challenged Israel to fight that we see the the themes of David's entire life all on display. What I want you to learn from David's life is that David was who he was not because he was a man after God's own heart. God liked him. That's not what that means. It means that David chased after the heart of God. There's no way to chase the heart of God if you don't know the heart of God. Let's go ahead and continue in this story and mine some of these principles out. So we've got Goliath standing in the valley. He's challenged both sides and Israel's afraid. So there's this stalemate. Here's the agreement. You come and bring your best guy and we'll bring our best guy and There's no need for both armies to just battle against each other. And Israel can't come up with a guy that's worthy. Jesse had seven sons. And the three oldest sons are in Saul's army. And the four youngest are back home. David being the youngest of all seven. And we know That when Samuel, in just one chapter earlier, anoints David as king, he's the shepherd of the family. And so Jesse calls David in from the fields, and he says, take some corn, some bread, and some cheese to your brothers who are fighting against the Philistines. And so David does, as his father says, takes the, I think it's ten loaves of bread, something like that, and the the cheese and the corn, uh, dried corn, and he brings it to him. And when Jesse gets there, he, you know, or, or when David gets there, he kind of shows up with, with all of the enthusiasm of a young guy that wishes he could fight but isn't allowed to. He really does. He gets there and, and he asks uh, the, the soldiers, they're kind of in a group, and he says, hey guys, how's it going? And uh, we can actually pick up our reading in the story in verse 23. Uh, it says that, that as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, verse 23. Uh, out of the armies of the Philistine, and he spake according to the same words that David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? You kind of get this picture. David shows up and you go, Hey guys, how's it going? It's not going good. Why? There's this huge guy, and no one, no one can beat him. And David is just in astonishment. He can't believe it. Like, Who would ever defy God's army? And while he's saying it, Scripture says that here comes Goliath with his daily challenge. Still haven't found anybody, Israel. Come on, is there a man in your camp? And David can't believe it, and the soldiers say, did you see him? Like, did did you look at him? And we continue to read. I just, I love the way they said that. Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, verse 25, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David didn't fight Goliath for Saul. And he didn't fight Goliath for his fellow soldiers. What you're going to see is that David fought Goliath for God. 
And there's no way David does that if David doesn't have intimate knowledge of who God is. A passing fancy or a preference isn't going to cut it when life is on the line. Some of you have tried to answer that question in the context of revival or a sermon or revival services or evangelist preaching. Would you die for Jesus? And like Peter, you would say, oh yes! But I would attest, how are you going to die for someone that you don't know at all? Verse 27, the people answered him after this manner, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? What are you doing here, man? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? He puts David right in his place, doesn't he? Who who do you think you are? The shepherd boy? Really? Yeah. Who's watching your sheep? Your all-important job. David, who do you think you are? He goes on to say, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest take the battle, or that thou mightest see the battle. Look at verse 29. We get just a hint of what's actually going on in David's heart. His brother thinks he's got him pegged. We know why you're here. You're here because you love yourself. You're here because you think this is nothing but a big game. This is no game and this is no joke, David. And listen to what David says. In verse 29, he said, What have I now done? What are you, what are you, Ellie, what are you yelling at me for? What did I do to you? And then he says this. Is there not a cause? And when the words were heard, which David spake, verse 31, they rehearsed them before Saul. You say, what are those words? Well, <laughs> David says, I got this. I love that. Is there not a cause? You've heard me say that why is one of the most important questions you can ever ask. So can I ask you, why are you worshiping today? Are you worshiping because of a knowledge that you have of God or out of self-interest? You see, why matters. And David says, I have a reason for why I'm doing what I'm doing, and it isn't vain glory. So the guys go to Saul and they say, hey, there's this guy David and he said he's willing to do it. Now Goliath comes out, they could have picked anybody, but what would have been just if someone's going to go out there? And it's pretty obvious, whoever does it, it's going to be mismatched. Well, the man that's supposed to be the greatest in all of Israel, Saul. Remember, when they picked Saul, they picked him because he was taller than everybody else. As the scripture said, he went head above, sh- above shoulders. And yet, Saul isn't the one that's running out there. Verse 32. By the way, verse uh, 31, Saul says, well, go get him. <laughs> go get David. I, w- I want to talk to him. Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Don't be discouraged. You're looking for him. I'm here. I got this. And everybody focuses on what David does, but don't lose track of why. Is there not a cause? And so there is this discussion back and forth. David tells Saul, hey, I'm not just some kid. I've fought before. You know, you can imagine this conversation. Have you ever even killed anybody before? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Who? Well, it wasn't so much a who, more a what. All right, well, then what did you kill? Was it one of them little blackbirds? No, it was a lion. Well, why'd you kill the lion? He came after the sheep. And what did you do? It grabbed him by the beard and took him out. 
Sure you did. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Bear? A bear. Yeah. Yeah. Took a bear out too. And this conversation's going on back and forth. Verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Don't you love the way David talks? Is there not a cause? Verse 36. He hath defied the armies of the living God. And this can't stand. Moreover, David said in verse 37, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. In the next verse, Saul takes his armor and has it put on David. And David says, I, I can't. I've never even worn stuff like this. I can't. I can't take this stuff. I don't need it. Verse 39, David girded his sword upon his armor, and he is said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I can't go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Verse 40, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. He was good looking. The Philistine says, Am I a dog that thou came to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then he threatens him in verse 44. Let's go ahead and jump to verse 45 where we say David's response. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield. Now you remember the spear, right? Just the head of the spear is 15 pounds. That's the pokey thing at the end of the stick. Can you imagine what this guy's sword must look like? If a sword could be anywhere from a third to a half of a man's height, and that's a normal sword, you get into a long sword. My goodness, this guy is over eight feet tall. He's got his shield, his helmet. David's got nothing. David said, you came to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield. But I have come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. Oh, it's definitely a lopsided battle. You didn't bring a big enough helmet, and you didn't bring a big enough shield, and you didn't bring a big enough sword, because I brought God with me. Now, how can David say that with such confidence? He didn't all of a sudden find God. He walked with God because David knew God. We go on to read, he says, I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistine this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Remember the accusation from Eliab to David. What are you doing here? I know the naughtiness of your heart. And what does David say? Isn't there a cause? And when he comes in front of Saul, what does he tell Saul? Man, he is making fun of Almighty God. And then one more time, in front of the Philistine. Go 
Goliath, I'm going to take off your head and I'm going to put it on a stick. And when your head is on a stick, the world will know this. There is a God in Israel. This isn't about you versus me. This is about my God versus your false gods. This isn't about my honor, my brother's honor, or Saul's honor. It's not about the boys and the girls or the ladies back home. This is all about God. And God's going to win because I've watched what he does. I know him. And I love him. David was at a place where he was ready to die for God. But was so confident in what God could do, never even considered death. Why? Because he knew God, not because he felt God. And I'd like to prove it to you. I went through, after reading this story and seeing the intimacy, the confidence that David had, and knowing that he was a student, a hard pursuer of the heart of God, and you say, boy, I really wish we had his writing so we could see the things that he thought about God. We do. They're called the book of Psalms. If you would go to Psalm uh, chapter 5, or Psalm number 5, I'll just give you a real quick glimpse. Speaking of the highness of God in Psalm number 5, he says in verse 1, give ear, to my word, uh, give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King, and my God. In Psalm 95, speaking of the highness of God, David says, you are a king not just above all kings, but above every God. You're high. Your throne is lifted up and no one is as awesome as you are. In Psalm 7, he says, In thee do I put my trust. He goes on in Psalm 7 to say, Judge me because I know you're always right. And if you judge me, you're right and I'm wrong. In Psalm 8, he calls God excellent, glorious, and mighty as he considers the stars in the sky. In Psalm number 4, David says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. You are perfectly righteous and I'm not. And so in Psalm 6, he says, Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger or chasten me in thy hot displeasure, but have mercy on me, O Lord. For I am weak, O Lord, heal me. For my bones are vexed. This isn't a man who felt deeply. This is a man who thought deeply about God. Speaking of our own context and the week that we've experienced, Listen to Psalm 12. David writes this to the chief musician, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. Does that sound like the kind of week we've had? Stay-at-home orders instantly lifted. No longer COVID-19 matters. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said with our tongue, will we prevail and our lips are our own who is Lord over us. For the oppression of the poor and for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Speaking of our context When are people going to realize that what we need is a relationship with God and that God heals the poor, that God rescues those who are trampled on, that when when we need a time of humility and weakness to turn to God and ask for rescue, we puff up and try and rescue ourselves and say, who is going to ever be in charge over us? 
David says the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Run to God. The greatest thing about being oppressed is it should drive you to the feet of a loving father. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Does that not give you the image of people running through the streets among these protesters smashing windows? And David says, I'm going to look to Almighty God who is high and holy. Because in Psalm 3, he calls God my shield. And in Psalm 9, he calls him my refuge. In Psalm 11, he declares that God is loving. And he bolsters it in Psalm 16 with God's strength. In Psalm 13, he says, God is my sustainer. Because later on in that same Psalm, he says, because he's gracious and loves me. And in Psalm 16, David says, I have found the enabler of all my joy. David loved God because David knew who God was. If you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to get to know God. And I'm not talking about feeling more. In our tip series, we've been talking about the role that feelings play versus the role that truth plays. And uh, Paul set the scene in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and said, Hey, Timothy, I know you're feeling upset because I'm about to die, but that's not, that's not the Holy Spirit's ministry. Don't follow your feelings. Follow his leading. He's not given us the feelings of fear, but has given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. You will never be able to walk with God if you don't get to know God. You say, okay, how can I get to know God? Very quickly, let me give you two two resources right now that you have. Resource number one. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. In Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You want to get to know God and in so doing, try to understand yourself, read the Bible. It's quick, it's powerful, and it's sharp. And you will not be able to walk with God if you don't read it. I don't know any other more plain way to say it. And so let me give you, in resource number one, reading scripture, four principles to help you as you read God's word. Principle number one, don't substitute the word of God with anything less than it. Some of you read devotional books and you think, well... I read my daily bread, and so I read the Bible. You read a book about the Bible. That doesn't mean you read the Bible. Any book that's ever been written outside of Scripture, even as great as it is, is less than God's Word. So don't substitute God's Word with something less than that. You can use it as a resource, but you need to be reading God's Word. Principle number two, do not read for the sake of reading. Have you ever picked up one of those annual read through the Bible? I'll tell you there's value in reading through the Bible. We'll talk about that in just a second. But some of you, you're so bent on just making sure you read that thing because if I do, then God is happy with me. So I got to read. Why are you reading? To get to know God. You say, well, I can't do that and read it in a year. Then don't. Take five years to read the Bible. Here's a question. The person that took five years to read the Bible all the way through, do they know the Bible more carefully than the person that read it five times without understanding? Yes. Don't lose track of why you're reading. You're reading God's Word to understand it. Principle number three when it comes to reading the Bible. Avoid only reading the parts that you like. And this catches preachers. I was challenged early on in ministry to preach the entire counsel of the Word of God. Why? Because if I only ever preach what I like to preach, God will never confront what He needs to confront. 
He said, well, I don't like, you know, I don't like the Old Testament. I just want to read about the New Testament. But listen, you will have no appreciation for the slaying of the Lamb if you don't read the book of Leviticus. You say, well, I just love the Old Testament. But it is an incomplete promise until Jesus comes and fulfills the law. You need the whole book. So read the whole book. Principle number four. When something impacts you deeply, memorize it. Because you don't want to lose it. Here's the four principles for reading God's word. Don't substitute the word of God with anything less than it. Don't read for the sake of reading. Read for the purpose of understanding. Avoid only reading the parts that you like. And I would add, be systematic in your reading. So go through, you know, because if I don't do that, I just end up in the Gospels all the time. And then number four, when something impacts you deeply, memorize it because you don't want to lose it. And the second resource that you have is the preaching of the Word of God. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll show you what the Bible says is the role that preaching is supposed to play. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul writes, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God uses preaching. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block into the Greeks' foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ The power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Apostle Paul says, you can call preaching foolish, but it's God's foolishness. And it's better than the best you've got. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh and not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Thank God for preaching. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption, If you want to learn about God and how to walk with God, pay attention to the foolishness of preaching. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Not because preaching is of men, but because preaching is of God. Four quick principles for preaching that will help you grow under the preaching of God's word. Uh, Principle number one, preaching is not entertainment. Name the top three preachers that you like and tell me you haven't picked them because of the way that they entertain you. But remember what Paul said. Sound preaching to the ungodly sounds like foolishness. Oh, how many times I find myself working hard just to keep people attached to the word of God because we are an entertainment-driven society. Entertainment is, or preaching is not entertainment. It is you and I mutually agreeing for God to work on us together. Principle number two, anything that helps you understand the text is a gift from God. I was overwhelmed when I was 10 years old and I preached the life of Joseph, Joseph in five minutes flat. My first sermon ever. I almost passed out. And I probably would have if I had gone six minutes. I looked down and the only notes I had was a simple note card and I realized I probably should have written more. But I will never forget when Mr. Mechnick walked up to me with tears in his eyes and thanked me for showing him Joseph and saying something to the effect we all need to be more like him. It's probably one of the worst sermons ever preached on the life of Joseph. But a godly man was thankful because it gave him 
a little bit more insight into who God is. Principle number three, preaching is the product when the flesh of man meets with the Spirit of God. And there's this awesome interface that occurs, not just with the preacher himself and God, but with the people that are listening. And so watch for God's Spirit to work in you. And then number four, soft soil is closer to producing fruit than ground that hasn't been turned over yet. Get in the habit of praying before the preacher starts or before you head to church and ask God to change you. If you come expecting God to change you, I guarantee you he will. But if you come with a hard heart, then God will spend most of his time just trying to convince you that you need to be changed. You won't get to know God without studying him. And I will tell you this, studying him is hard work. But in that battlefield, there was only one that had. And his name was David. Who are you? God, thank you for the way that you pursue us. Now, if only we would reflect that back and pursue you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Felt long. Okay, that's fine. That's good. Oh no, <laughs> this is really tight. I'm gonna shoot my button. Is that recording back there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> None of that is making the outtakes. <laughs> Words to be passed down through the ages.